Hey everybody, I uh, made a video recently on propaganda and unfortunately I forgot to uh, set things up properly and so as a result I lost my entire screencast. So nobody was able to see anything I was drawing on the screen. Uh, but some people did reply already to the uh, the video I posted. Uh, it's right now sitting on YouTube and it has about a thousand views. And it's already elicited this uh, this great response on Reddit. Why is Charles voicing his twisted opinion on COVID-19? And uh, he, apparently uh, this doctor I'm citing is a pseudoscientist and he has no idea what he's doing. So I figured I'd reshoot the video, uh, but with uh, the screencast and go into perhaps some more focused detail about a few things and maybe get a more concise output. But in particular, I, before I began, I, I did want to point out some articles. Uh, so uh, let me turn on the screencast real quick, and then I'll show you a few things. Okay. And you are presenting your screen. Huzzah! So here's this nice little uh, post on Reddit from somebody. He says, uh, priding himself on building a blockchain based on scientific research, I find it very suspicious that Charles is choosing an entirely different path when it comes to public health. Even worse that he chooses to share this badly researched video with the community. The global scientific community is highly skeptical towards the Facebook sourcing of research data in the paper. And he concluded a fatality rate of 0.12% combined with the 15,400 per confirmed deceased New York City would mean 12.5 million people uh, live in New York City. Well, I wouldn't even be citing that. Uh, you know, here, first things first, uh, when we're actually talking about this uh, topic of antibody testing, every single place that people are testing people for antibodies. For example, the Netherlands, uh, they are finding meaningful amounts of people. New York City, finding meaningful amounts of people. And of course, uh, Dr. Ioannidis uh, was finding meaningful amounts of people uh, that have already gotten antibodies. Uh, and if you continue doing study after study after study. It doesn't matter the population group. It doesn't matter how you do it. If it's 500 people, 3,000 people, and you're finding a consistently high penetration rate only a few months after it's spread, uh, then it's definitely the case that more people have had this than we thought. It's only a question of how many, and that's a big scientific debate. Uh, and the whole point about citing John in uh, this, uh, this debate is that he's not a pseudoscientist. He's actually one of the most prominent doctors in the world. And it doesn't matter if conservative media or some other source is citing him or not. Uh, at the end of the day, this guy is an academic beast. In fact, he published a paper attacking scientists. And it's one of the most cited papers uh, of all time in medicine. It's cited over 8,341 times, published in 2005. And it says why most published research findings are false. You see, his speciality above and beyond actually being extremely strong in mathematics. In fact, he, he won awards when he was in Greece for this. But his speciality is, is actually dealing with meta-research. So basically, it's his job to look at the entire body of science for something and get an assessment of what's the overall opinion of the global scientific community. And he's really an expert at constructing experiments. And he's at Stanford, which is one of the best medical schools in the entire world. So he has strong mathematical background. He's the meta theory guy, the meta research guy. His papers are cited thousands and thousands of times. Uh, and so any experiment he constructs and statements he makes I, I feel they have a great degree of credibility behind them, especially given that he made almost no statements in January and February and March and waited until he actually had some research to have a discussion about things. So the point of the video that I shot earlier was basically the, the concept of propaganda. And basically propaganda, the way I think about it, going to red because people excuse me, orange people that have a little easier time with that color. But basically, there's this idea that you have this strong reaction. To something that you're not a domain expert in, you know, a little about it or none. And yet that reaction is so strong that you've developed a opinion you're willing to fight over. 
So you have an opinion you're going to share and you're going to fight. So there's all kinds of things in life that you probably don't know too much about. Like I'm willing to wager the vast majority of people probably don't know how to repair a septic tank or you know build a, an engine. Now, there's certainly a lot of people that do know how to do that, but proportionally, if you were to get 100 people in the population together, especially in maybe a big city, uh, the vast majority of them would not have those skill sets. So if you ask them the difference between uh, one septic system or engine, most people probably would not have an opinion about it. Certainly not a strong emotional visceral reaction, even though they don't know a lot about it. Uh, and they certainly wouldn't go and fight you and say, oh, well, uh, you know, Hemi is so much better than uh, th this engine or that engine or something like that. The black wing is crap and uh, GM has lost their ability to make engines. But the, every now and then you run into opinions. And actually, we see a lot in politics where people really legitimately don't know a lot about it. For example, healthcare. It is a very complicated topic, an incredibly complicated topic. We're talking about trillions of dollars. We're talking about a sixth of the entire US economy. Uh, we're talking about millions of people employed in it. And we're, we're talking about tons of issues from legal liability issues to fragmentation of data to misincentives where there's perverse financial incentives. Uh, there's issues where people aren't willing to admit mistakes because of liability. Uh, there are probably, if you wanted to list them all out, a good 20 to 30 books you have to read worth of content to get a real good grapple and understanding of the totality of the American healthcare system. And we can all agree it's not working so well. It's very expensive and we're not having good outcomes, but it's pretty difficult to decide where to go and what to do. Yet, people, despite the fact that the vast majority actually don't have strong domain expertise in it, they only know a little bit about it. They have very strong reactions. In fact, so much so that when they fight, people who oppose their opinions, however shallow they might be, they basically say things like, you want other people to die. Person X to die. So the point of this series of videos is, is really an analysis of why do people do that in general? Why, why do people, when there's some topic, it could be healthcare, uh, it could be philosophical issues, it could be end of life issues, it could be COVID. And a COVID is a phenomenal example because it's impacting all of us. Why do people have such strong opinions such that they're willing to write things like this? Uh, why is Charles voicing his twisted opinion? Apparently, I'm here to reject the entire scientific community. By the way, there's no consensus on the scientific community right now about COVID. In fact, the only consensus is that we need more data. Nobody knows. The WHO is not even sure if you have immunity if you catch it. Who knows? We don't even know if a vaccine is going to work at this point. There are no vaccines on market uh, for coronavirus that have shown safety and efficacy yet. There's some promising trials but we won't know for a while. We have no current therapeutics that work. We have some ideas like remdesivir uh, could potentially have some upside. And there's a few other things that are currently in random controls, uh, clinical trials, but we actually don't know. We don't know actually what the case fatality rate is. Every single intellectually honest doctor and scientist will tell you the CFR is unknown. Another thing is there's a great degree of corruption in the data that we have been collecting. For example, in Italy, uh, this particular poster said there's big morgues. Uh, churches have been converted to morgues. Well, if Vito goes into the ICU and Vito is a 70 year old man and he has lots of comorbidities, tons of comorbidities, And this, he also is currently having congestive heart failure and, and his overall health is really terrible. And he contracts COVID and dies. When he dies from COVID, we'll say that was a COVID death. Check. And that goes into the statistics pool. We're seeing a lot of this. In fact, this is the dominant group, people over the age of 60, 
uh, people who are obese, people with lots of comorbidities, uh, people who smoked for a long period of time, that's your demographic. Now, is it really fair to say that coronavirus was the definite agent there? Because what if they got regular everyday influenza? Every year, over 500,000 people globally die from influenza. And if Vito here had caught influenza, there would be a very high chance that he'd have a poor outcome, especially if he was in the ICU and needed to be ventilated. So yeah, okay, Corona did that, but there's more to the story here. It's a very complicated issue. It's a multivariate issue. There are lots of confounding factors. And this is not something that lay people understand. Really, the experts, they'll be the first to tell you there is no consensus we're not really sure about any of these things, uh, and we're just trying to work our way through it. And the point of the last video that I made was that I listed the knowns, and then I listed the unknowns. So currently, a lot of coronavirus talk lives in the unknown category, things like the case fatality rate. We don't know the r not. We don't know about immunity. We don't know about therapeutics. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that's sitting here. We don't have good treatments, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of people trying to work on that. A great group of people who are well more qualified and they're figuring it out. But on the nodes, knowns, we do know that there is severe economic damage. That is undebatable. You don't need a PhD in epidemiology. You don't need to sit down and spend your life as a physician to understand the economic damage of basically saying the entire economy, global economy, is shut down. You don't need a PhD to understand that when people are forced to stay at home, they've lost their jobs and they're under enormous stress and uncertainty that these things cause social damage. Marriages collapse. People feel useless. People run out of money. They could no longer pay their bills. I just read an article the other day that we've seen a huge spike of reports of landlords asking for sexual favors from female tenants in exchange for keeping them uh, in their apartments. Just imagine that, being basically molested and raped by your landlord because you can't pay rent. This is a reality. It's happening today, right here, right now, to millions of people in the United States and globally, millions more. And in the developed world, these nation states can mostly rebound. So we're looking for that kind of V-shaped curve. We hope we'll have it. In the developing world, it looks more like that. And it's unknown if they can even ever recover without substantial amounts of direct foreign investment. So these are certainties of a lockdown. We know these things. So why do you do a lockdown? Well, in my uh, original video, I said it was more like a tactical retreat. Tactical retreat. And basically the idea is that you've been surprised by something and we've all been surprised on a global basis. Uh, we walked into a room and then somebody just started shooting at us. So what's the first instinct? find cover and get your bearings and then figure out what the hell is going on and then make a plan. And that's what this knee jerk quarantine basically was. Something hit us and we had models like the Imperial model, for example, and the Imperial model basically said millions and millions of people, if not tens of millions will die fast. It was resurrecting the specter of Spanish flu. And this was mentioned many, many, many times. And that was very scary. And so we did a tactical retreat as a collective society. We pulled back. We said, boy, let's just lock up for a little bit. And understanding that when we do that, we are walking into a world that we fully, fully appreciate if we stay too long in it, we'll have catastrophic social consequences. But we said, you know what? It's worth it because millions of people are going to die otherwise. So we absolutely need to do this. Now, 184 countries have this. Not every single one of them embraced this idea. For example, Sweden 
did not. And what's truly amazing to me is that apparently everybody over the internet with a keyboard on Twitter, Reddit, they're just armchair experts in epidemiology now. And they, they mentioned Sweden has 10 times as much the rate as Norway or these other countries nearby. Because apparently they all understand the dynamics of Sweden versus Norway versus Denmark. And these are apples to apples comparisons in their mind. It is an interesting thought experiment. Take the total amount of people who have died in Sweden in the population of Sweden and extrapolate that to the population of Italy. And you'll find that Italy has actually had more death when you extrapolate it than Sweden. And you'll say, oh, that's not fair. Sweden's a different country than Italy. And that's certainly true. So then why are we comparing Norway to Sweden? These are different countries as well. It'd be much more fair to compare Norway to Wyoming in terms of density. They're about the same in that respect. Uh, there's more population in Norway, but the density is about the same in that respect. If you pick an average person outside of a few epicenters like um, Oslo. Okay, well, but everybody apparently knows better because it's convenient to their agenda. And what is that agenda? It's not their own agenda. The whole point of the series of videos is, it's a, pro a series of videos on propaganda. This concept that you're having a strong reaction, so strong you're willing to go to Reddit and immediately say that I have a twisted opinion, a twisted opinion. I just don't care about people dying. I want blood in the streets for unknown reasons. It doesn't financially benefit me one way or the other. In fact, uh, frankly, it probably would make me more money in the long run if this quarantine ran a longer time because it helps cryptocurrencies and I'm heavily invested there, and I'm not gonna lose my job over this. We have a strong economic moat, but I guess I have a twisted opinion for unknown reasons. So they have very strong reaction, and I'm willing to wager, because of the appeal to authority and no direct uh, actual rebuttal of any of the data presented, that the particular poster probably is not a domain expert, and I am willing to wager that the fact that he's willing to fight you know, shame me and share that publicly and attack us. What does that mean? It means that he's been propagandized. And that's the meta point about this entire series of videos. It's actually not about COVID. It's not about coronavirus. It's nice to talk about it because it's a great example and it does elicit very strong reactions from people. And what I'm trying to say is those reactions aren't your own. Okay, those reactions aren't your own. That's what I've been trying to say over and over and over and over and over again, uh, that these reactions that these posters are experiencing are a direct result of consuming information and consuming thoughts in a way that have basically replaced whatever personal opinion they have with someone else's opinion. And this is pervasive in modern society. It's why politics don't work right now. It's why everybody's fighting right now. It's why everybody's so angry right now. Because at the end of the day, if we're having an academic discussion, the very first thing we would do with an academic discussion is we'd look at models. We would date, debate things like inputs. We would try to ask design of experiments. We would be looking at data sets and be asking ourselves which ones are reasonable ones. Be asking about what type of tests we need to run. These types of things, the list goes on and on and on. These are the things that we'd actually be discussing and the point is truth. We actually don't know. I don't know. When this whole crisis started, I consumed the imperial model and I said, well, these are domain experts, they should know. And I got very worried because they were telling me millions of people were going to die. I looked at the models, I looked at the inputs, and I said, well, I'm not a domain expert here, but this does look like decent math, and the inputs aren't necessarily unreasonable. And then what happened is the clock ran. And when that clock started running, what did we learn? That the model was wrong. And they didn't account for dynamic behavior. For example, people change their decision-making processes based upon available information. 
They start automatically social distancing. They start automatically isolating sick people. They start automatically following better hygiene. They start wearing masks, these types of things. And that has a profound impact on things like how many people end up spreading it to other people, you know? And uh, that dynamicism always makes whatever model you've constructed inaccurate. You have to tune and adjust your model. So based on this new information, I started saying, well, let's take a step back and let's try to at least establish the case fatality rate. Because if we can do that, then we can start making proper policy decisions about what are we going to do? Because the cost here is so enormous. And this is being minimized and minimized and minimized. It's, it's almost axiomatic. People are saying, if we don't do total all out absolute quarantine, you have blood on your hands. Every single person who died is basically would never have died if we had a total quarantine. First, that's not true. And second, they're escaping another fact of life. And I mentioned it in the prior video. Your existence is risky. People don't tend to think in these terms, but insurance people do. Epidemiologists do. Anybody who looks at a population realizes that the minute that you let people start interacting with each other in a social setting, these interactions have a probability of harm. Now, that can be very small, that can be very high, it depends on the particular circumstances, but there is no exception to this universal truth. You can contract a disease, and it doesn't have to be coronavirus, and spread that disease to others. You can uh, engage in risky behavior with people, drinking, uh, drugs. Uh, you can uh, you drive in a car, kills 50,000 people per year. The minute that you launch quarantine, just by that very act, you will be responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths. And we as a society are okay with that. Why? Because we know those things. They're, they're quantified. We accept that every year, half a million or more people will die from influenza. Every single year we've accepted this. It's one of the most lethal diseases in human history. It's killed more people probably than anything else, with perhaps the exception of malaria. But we accept that, and we say, okay, we got to live our life, so we're willing to take this. And people who say, well, this is not the flu, they say, this is so much worse than the flu, and they cite the case fatality rate. And what I've been trying to tell everybody is that as we evolve through this crisis, we're starting to learn that the case fatality rate is probably much lower. And then there's this question of, what is an acceptable CFR? It is not good enough to say zero. It's going to be there. If we're willing to leave society open with influenza, and let's say that's somewhere here, depending upon the population, give or take. If we're willing to leave society open with a CFR at that level, would you be okay with a CFR at 0.1%? Would you be okay with a CFR of 0.2? Would you be okay with a CFR of 0.3? Where on that spectrum? Do you want that CFR to sit before you say, no longer say, blood on your hands, twisted views, these types of things? This is not an academic question. This is a question that the entire world has to answer, and it has to answer it soon. Or else, here are the consequences. Economic depression, massive collapse on a global scale hundreds of millions of people losing their jobs. In the developed world, we have a social safety net. In the developing world, millions of people will die of starvation, war, crime, and other problems and lack of basic human needs. And there will be no resources for them. How many people do you think die every year in refugee camps? How many people do you think die every year in India and other places as a consequence of lack of basic needs? I've seen them in Africa. And that's in the best of times. 
And when we're in a global depression and there's 20 or 30 percent unemployment rates, how generous do you think the world will be to prop up the most vulnerable amongst us? That is a known. It's a certainty. Tell me, who, whose blood is that? Whose hands will that blood be on? It's certainly not mine, but it's going to be on somebody's hands. Okay, what about all the social damage that this is going to cause? The broken up families, the suicides, the profound mental trauma, in many cases physical trauma, the domestic violence, the people who are cast into homelessness. Those people. And... All those homeless people have significantly higher probabilities of being victims of sexual and physical abuse and dying. Tell me, when they die, whose blood is on their hands? Who's responsible for that? You, apparently, the other side of this argument is so willing to say, blood on your hands, blood on your hands, blood on your hands. Because again, we have to make this decision. Where on the spectrum of CFR is it okay to start suddenly say that, yes, we accept that some people are going to die, but we have to reopen to avoid these known consequences that will happen if we keep the world in quarantine for a long period of time. For some reason, people who have been propagandized have no concept of being able to weigh things and think of things in terms of this balance. Nothing in life is simple. As a CEO, every single day, I make difficult decisions. Lucky for me, I don't have to make life or death decisions. Some companies do, and they even buy insurance around it. But I do have to make decisions that impact people's livelihood and careers. I do have to make decisions about travel, in some cases, sending people into dangerous situations, especially in Africa, which does carry risk. And I've had to live with the consequences of those decisions, and I weigh pros and cons and facts and circumstances as best I can. But in this particular crisis, because of propaganda, for some reason this has become a partisan issue, a blue team, red team issue, uh, an issue where everybody who opposes whatever viewpoint has been imported by usually the media or some other organization, those people are enemies and listening to them is catastrophic and will destroy all of society. People are absolutely convinced of that. And then when we try to have an argument about it, a debate about it, and say, well, let's talk about the data. Any person, even a person as prestigious as a professor at Stanford University, award from the Greek Mathematical Society, attended Harvard University, University of Athens, I have a research lab there, who's written hundreds of papers, some of the most cited papers in all of medicine. He, he's an Einstein fellow. It, it basically, he's the guy you go to when you want to do good science. When this guy writes some article after months of thinking about it, understanding the tension in this, we can't even pay attention to him. We just offhand discount him because his views disagree with our views. So again, going back to the strong reaction about things, let's be honest here, know little about and yet willing to fight for it over the internet, really fight for it and say statements like twisted viewpoints and blood on your hands. And we're not even allowed to have a conversation about the known risks and the things that are gonna happen. And then when we actually start digging into the unknowns, the reality is we just don't know. Yet we are being asked to make policy decisions as a society that carry profound consequences long-term to the global order and to our economic prosperity. And I ask again, personally, where do you sit on the spectrum? Are you okay with one in a thousand people dying? Are you okay with one in 10,000 people dying? How would you even, as an individual, make that decision? How would you compare these things? Most people off the cuff would say, oh, well, one in 10,000 is too much. Well, that's certainly influenza. So we're already okay with that. Nobody seems to be panicking about it. So maybe one in a thousand, are we okay with that? Or one in a hundred, that seems to be pretty high. Or one in 50, that's pretty high. Or one in 30, where do we sit there? Okay, certainly as we go in this direction, that's not tolerable. But then you break it down and you say, well, is this the only way? We're asked to make a Boolean choice, one, zero. Is that a false dichotomy? 
perhaps there's a way that we can let the people who all the evidence is starting to suggest is like the flu for them, the young and healthy, maybe they can go back to work and then the vulnerable population can somehow be segregated. And people say, well, that's just not practical. That's too expensive. We can't figure that out. But okay, it's perfectly reasonable for the United States just to quarantine everybody and spend $6 trillion out of thin air and debase the entire US dollar. That's a better idea. Did anybody get consulted on that? Do you really think it through? Couldn't we find a way to segregate? Could we even talk about it? Could we look at other places? There's 184 countries suffering from this. Maybe we could figure it out. You know, back in the day, they used to segregate in infected populations. They had leper colonies. They had people with tuberculosis go to different places. Maybe for a small period of time, we could take the vulnerable and weak and place them in places that were you could tightly control the inflow and outflow of people. For example, islands and things like that. Maybe these are some ideas we should consider other than destroying our entire economy. And it's okay to say no. It's okay to brainstorm these types of things because at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? We're trying to solve a problem. And that problem is that there's a group of people who when they catch this, they certainly have a case fatality rate above a percentage point. And those are the people we really need to think carefully about and protect. That's not being anti-science, saying that there happens to be another group of people that don't have that. And that's why we're seeing such high antibody rates. That's mostly amongst the young and the healthy. Just like every year, if you're young and you're healthy and you get flu, you have a pretty damn good shot of not even noticing it or having a mild case. That's a fact of life. Every single one of us has gone through every single year. And so we're not allowed, though, apparently in this political environment and culture to even have the consideration of alternatives to brainstorm, to say that perhaps it's not a good idea to completely shut down our economy, burn things to the ground. Uh, perhaps it's not a good idea to make major global decisions on incomplete data. There's so much urgency because of these unknowns that we have to act now. And we are being told by people, many cases, billionaires and politicians who will not suffer any consequences from long-term global shutdown. In many cases, make money from these global shutdowns because they can buy things at the absolute bottom when there's blood all over the ground. And when the economy recovers, make a windfall profit from it. They can take larger risks when no one else can, that the only thing we can do is wait for a vaccine. And we actually don't know. We honestly do not know if one will even work. We don't. There's a safety and efficacy component, and there's also a mutation component. There's certainly a possibility that by the time we even have a vaccine for the original COVID virus, that we'll have a new variant of it that that vaccine doesn't work against. This is why every year we have flu shots, and despite that, people still get sick from the flu. It's reality we live in. So we don't know if a vaccine is going to work. We have tons of unknowns, especially the case fatality rate. We're starting to see some light. We're starting to see some puzzles. And the very people who are trying the hardest and most diligently and ethically to dig us out of this and get us real data so that those unknowns can become knowns are now becoming the victims of the consequences of political propaganda for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I really don't. I'm not even going to speculate on it. But it's sickening to me. It really is. I'm seeing an increase of homeless people in my own community. And I know day after day, the longer this goes on, the more of them I'm going to see. I'm seeing an increase in friends and family who are being personally financially impacted by this. You know, and these are not academic questions. These are not science-based questions. These are human consequences. And Colorado is a pretty strong and healthy state economically. It's probably going to be unimaginably more difficult in Detroit, in New York, and other places. Uh, and for a lot of people, this is the event that's going to define a decade or longer of their life. And it's really going to break up families. It's going to have tremendous psychological, physical, in some cases, uh, mental, excuse me, uh, there's going to be tremendous 
mental and psychological, in some cases physical, impact on people. Uh, and I absolutely guarantee you that some people are going to kill themselves over this. It's going to happen. We don't know the exact rate. Anecdotally, um, in, if we're arguing by analogy, uh, generally when unemployment goes up a percentage point, we see a 1% increase in uh, suicide. There's a strong correlation there, and it kind of makes sense. When people lose their sense of identity and purpose and feel they can no longer provide, they get hopeless and they go into a spiral, and it causes profound bad consequences. A lot of crime will come out of this, violent crime and nonviolent crime, and our jails will fill breaking up even more families and destroying even more lives and quality of life will collapse. These are known things. And I have enormous empathy and sympathy for the people who are going to suffer from this. I care about each and every one of them and they matter. Every life matters. And to say that I have blood on my hands because I have the audacity to question orthodoxy, especially in the industry we happen to be in, where I was told by every single central bank that all cryptocurrencies are scams and our monetary policy will lead to the largest Ponzi scheme in human history when they're the ones who print $6 trillion and alter their monetary policy on a drop of a hat with no consequences. And I'm not, but I have blood on my hands for challenging orthodoxy. There is nothing I have said that is unscientific. There's nothing I have said that it's conspiratorial. There's nothing that I've said that can't be backed up by at least one study or one good thought process. And the people who are criticizing me about this are people who are basically propagandized. And that's the point. That's the point of this whole series of videos. It's the point of everything I'm trying to accomplish here. Think, think, you have to develop thinking skills. Nothing I am doing is going to work cryptocurrencies. Nothing is going to work in that industry if you are incapable of thinking. Our industry is about liberation. It's about giving you control of your own identity, property, giving you control over your own life. All these things in your life have been taken from you, and the people who took it from you told you they had to do it for the greater good and society wouldn't function otherwise. And our industry is an experiment in handing people personal power and liberty back your rights back. But that doesn't work if you're so willing to outsource your thoughts and import someone else's thoughts on a drop of a hat. So you have to be skeptical. In mathematics, any single time someone claims they have proven something, there's a burden there, proof. And we all in that industry kind of know what that looks like. So similarly, in life, you get all these inputs, all this news, all these articles about somebody said this, somebody did this, somebody's responsible for this. And you have to be skeptical about it. You have to ask, why is that true? You have to look for evidence. You know, and there's so much great material on critical thinking. There are critical thinking societies. There are great books on critical thinkings. I can recommend some of them. And the whole point is they allow you to look at each input in its own light, be professionally skeptical about those inputs, and understand for this particular topic what the burden of proof is. And every single technique and method you will ever learn when on this topic always tells you the same thing. Remove emotion. And they also tell you, steel man, which means try to understand the other side. Every single text will tell you that. But if you find yourself, despite the fact that you know little about it, having strong emotions to the extent that you fight. 
You want to share those opinions across the world and you're prepared to go to war over them. This is not critical thinking. This is someone else's thought product and it exists in your brain because somebody initiated the P word, propaganda. It's not partisan. It lives on both sides. Trump is a horrific offender of it. Uh, he commits more logical fallacies than I think any politician in my lifetime. And he is a disgusting human being in many respects. I have very little respect for him as a man. But that in no way indemnifies, inoculates, or excuses this disgusting behavior on the left. And in no way does it mean that everything needs to be a partisan issue where we have Team Blue and we have Team Red. And everything has to be viewed from that viewpoint. Quarantine is not a political issue. It's a human rights issue. And it's weighing risk. It's all it's about. And our only goal should be quantifying it to a point where we can make a decision and we can pick that number X, whatever that number is of case fatality rate, where we are comfortable and we will accept it. Understanding that we might not have good treatments and understanding we might never have a vaccine. You know what? My grandfather, my great grandfather and all of that generation lived with polio. They lived with tons of terrible infectious diseases. If you study the history of Richard Nixon, he lost two brothers to tuberculosis. A U.S. president, recent history, two brothers to tuberculosis. That was life. And everybody went to work. They were okay with it. They accepted it. It was a risk that was tolerable. We have lived as human beings in periods of famine and war and disease from the Apennine Plague that ended the Roman Empire broke its might and set it to a period of decline uh, to the Justinian plague that prevented the Byzantines from reuniting the Roman Empire and led to the rise of the Middle Ages. We've lived through this as humans and there's precedent for it. And we've gotten addicted to modern medicine, believing that infectious diseases are the past. Tell me, what happens when antibiotics don't work anymore? What happens when they're all drug resistant? Go to Mongolia, there's a drug resistant STDs, a drug resistant gonorrhea, there's drug resistant tuberculosis there. All kinds of really nasty things. MRSA kills a lot of people. So when the antibiotics no longer work and that golden window we had where we could treat all these horrible things, what do we do then? Do we just all shut down and go into quarantine to avoid these infectious diseases from killing millions of people like they've historically done in the 19th century? No, we won't. Life is risk. You take it, you mitigate it, you manage it. Job of governments is to balance it. And when you have unknowns, the job of the government is to quantify unknowns, to try to understand the threat. And when they're unwilling to do that, like with the war on terrorism, and they're unwilling to do that, like with a lot of economic crises, you're unwilling to do that, like with what happened with the weapons of mass destruction debacle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then they're replacing good governance with a particular agenda. Now, I'll leave it to the reader to decide what that agenda is, because I honestly don't know. There's not enough evidence to know, but you can know there's something there, because no one's really caring about the facts anymore. And I am absolutely disgusted with the American media. I think that they have committed malpractice on a colossal scale, and they have turned a human rights issue, they have turned a social issue, they have turned a medical issue that is having profound mental anguish on the American people and the people of the world into a partisan issue. And they're viewing it from the lens of, does it help or hurt particular people that we want to win and lose? It makes me sick. It's not productive. We should every single day ask them to hold us accountable to getting basic information so we can make better decisions about when do we open the doors. But we're not doing that. And that's a direct result of basically the environment we're in. And the environment we're in is propaganda. By the way, you can also see this on so many other issues. For example, as a case study, do some scraping of Twitter and look for the term Russian bot. Every single time there's a debate on the left or there's support for a dark horse left-wing candidate like Tulsi Gabbard or Bernie or something like that, 
the opponents of that candidate will accuse the people of that side being Russian bots. Why? Because this whole Russian affair, the Russian bots, the Russian election interference, that was a major issue. And a whole bunch of people have been inoculated to believe that if somebody opposes their opinion, they're not even a human being. They're actually a disinformation AI that's there on behalf of a foreign government to sow deceit and dissent. Because how could somebody possibly have that opinion, a difference of opinion? Never once did they take a step back and say, well, maybe, maybe they have different values than I do. Maybe they have different beliefs than I do. Maybe they prioritize different things than I do. No, it's just simply, you're not a human being. Or you're such a different human being that you your values are so bad that you want to see people dead for an economic agenda or for your particular thing. You just hate every single person. You see, that's where we're at, and that's a consequence of propaganda. That's why I'm making these videos, because none of the products I'm going to build, guys, are going to work if you're not capable of thinking for yourself. Okay, that's it. Think for yourself. That's the whole point of all of this. These are twisted views. I thought for myself, and I still don't have an opinion on whether we should reopen or open America. I, I'm on the fence. I think we probably should reopen certain places, and we should leave other places closed, but I just don't have enough data. And also, I can't imagine having to be in a position like the governors are and the president is of having to accept the CFR. Because I do know, as the person who would make that decision, that by accepting that CFR, people will die from it. But you have to do that as a leader. You have to accept the negative consequences with the positive consequences. And if all this is, is a game, that every time there are negative consequences, we have to ignore all the positive consequences of the real leadership behind it and just hyper-focus on the negative consequences, you get the most conservative responses, which end up becoming the most harmful responses. You kick problems down the road long term. It's why our environment is being wrecked. It's why we have economic systems that are not fair. It's why we have these terrible problems that keep cropping up over and over and over and over again. But I do know at least enough to know that there are good people waking up every day who are thinking for themselves and doing great work trying to figure out basic things so that policymakers can finally get accurate information enough to be able to make those hard decisions. And it is not helpful to attack those people or consider those people to be proxies of political opinions that you don't agree with. They're human beings just like you and me, and they're trying to solve this problem just like you and me. And if you take a moment to think for yourself and you take a moment to abandon emotion and really get an understanding of who they are and where they're coming from, you'll find that you're actually going to give yourself the antidote for propaganda and you'll be less willing to fight. You'll be less sure about your opinion. The emotions will fade. And instead of knowing a little about it, you'll know a little bit more about it. You still won't be an expert, but at least you'll have a different perspective of the matter. And who knows, they might even change the way you think. And that's the point. That's the point of critical thinking. That's the point of depropagandizing yourself, taking yourself out of this matrix and putting yourself into a position where you're capable of making major life decisions about your finances, your property, your identity, or else you have no right to ask for privacy. You have no right to ask for rights because you're incapable of wisely using those rights. It has nothing to do with credentials. It has to do with good old fashioned hard work. And that's what you have to do. So that's the point of these video series, now three of them, and I'll keep making them if I have to. And I will not back down on any of this stuff. I really won't because at the end of the day, this has everything to do with my life's work and this has everything to do with the long-term success of not just Cardano, but our entire industry. And this has everything to do with the world we end up living in. Is it going to be a world of social credit? Is it going to be the world of tight hierarchies where you have pyramids and only a small group of philosopher kings live at the top and we're just told how things are going to be? 
Is it going to be a world of great chaos and death and oppression? Or is it going to be a world where the individual has freedom and they live in a great society and they enjoy their life and it's a sustainable world and we can solve problems and talk about them as civilized human beings? Whether we're in that world or the other world is entirely up to you and your ability to think for yourself and vote accordingly and express your opinions accordingly. And you should never be afraid to express opinions. You should never be accused of being a murderer for just having the audacity to ask, maybe it's not a good idea to shut down our entire globe and surrender all of our freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of commerce, freedom of expression, our freedom to move around, our freedom to conduct uh, basic business transactions, our freedom of religion, all of these things are being compromised. And in anybody who criticizes it seems to be anti-science, seems to be against things, even though the very people shouting anti-science aren't even willing to debate in a scientific debate. Basic stuff. Think for yourself. That's the point.